Today, the million dollar man who's waiting for the bubble to burst. Hello, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to another of our posts. Today, I've got economist John Adams with me. Hello, John. Good to see you again. How are you going today? I'm very good. A bit cold outside, but uh, we're and gonna windy. Have a, a, yeah, and windy, but we're going to have a really hot conversation today. I think. Absolutely. Okay. So, what are we going to talk about today? Then we're going to talk about what the Reserve Bank has been doing with interest rates, um, because uh, in my view, there's been a big uh, policy failure for the last, uh, you know, thirty years. Uh, we've got the record. We've got the lowest official interest rates at the moment, um, and the Reserve Bank is trapped in the biggest debt bubble and they can't normalise interest rates. Right, so interest rates are very low. They've been as low as they've ever been for the last, what, couple of years, pretty much, right? That's correct. Yeah, and in the last statement from the Reserve Bank, they were basically saying, well, at some point, rates may go up, but they're not gonna go up anytime soon. Precisely. Right, okay. So, John, let's start with just thinking a little bit about how interest rates are set and what the policy drivers are. Sure. So going back to the early 90s, the Reserve Bank of Australia um, imposed an inflation targeting regime um, of 2 to 3% over the medium term. And basically, they've been raising uh, or lowering interest rates based on what happens with inflation. So when inflation goes up, uh, they raise interest rates to, to cool the economy. Um, and when inflation goes low, they, they cut interest rates. Uh, and basically, they've been using the CPI in particular, uh, the Consumer Price Index published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, as the main measure of, of how inflation is being measured throughout the economy. Um, and, and what we've sort of seen through that process is, is that they have gone from 15% um, in terms of official interest rates of the last recession in April of 1990 to uh, where they are today at 1.5%. Um, uh, and that is in a record low. It's been uh, low. It's been at that level for more than two years. Uh, and obviously, the, the current governor has been the uh, governor since September of 2016. So he hasn't raised interest rates uh, or lowered interest rates in that time. He's just a state pat. Uh, and and there was an article in the last week where the Reserve Bank uh, came out and said that their expectation is that inflation will go to two and a half percent by 2021. And then because, uh, because of that, there is no appetite to raise interest rates um, in the near term. Uh, and there's a view that interest rates may stay on hold for at least another 12 to 18 months. Now, uh, during this time, um, uh, we have seen uh, a massive expansion in the debt bubble. Uh, it's been a bubble that's been growing over 25 to 30 years. Uh, but uh, one of the key catalysts for that bubble has been these low rates because the rates, uh, the price of credit, the interest rate, is, setting, setting, is, is setting a, sending a signal throughout the economy that credit is cheap. And because of that, people have rushed in to borrow. And, and, and because they have borrowed enormous amounts of money, that's what spit up asset prices. And we've had enormous amounts of debt. Uh, and so, if, you know, for me, going back to uh, at least 2012-13, uh, when I was working for Sinodinus in federal parliament, I was, you know, having private conversations with the senator about interest rate policy, uh, economists to economists, and I was saying that we needed to um, re-examine the monetary policy framework uh, because the, low, the interest rates at that time were leading to excessive structural imbalances, which we've talked about in previous episodes. Um, and what we've seen over that period is rates are continuing to go down, uh, the people are borrowing more, house prices are going up, uh, and, and more importantly, the household debt continue, continues to grow. And interestingly, if you th sort of stand back and think internationally, we've seen low interest rates in other countries, and of course other central banks are also targeting that same inflation range. Yes. But the US and even now Europe looks like rates are going to be driving up. Yes, yes. So, so, so the Americans have raised rates, the British have raised rates, the Canadians have raised rates. Uh, I mean, obviously, the uh, Japanese and the ECB have continued to uh, uh, have rates at zero and doing quantitative easing, but they have sort of signaled that they will stop QE relatively soon, particularly the Europeans. Um, and, and, you know, the ECB said that they will stop. 
quantitative easing in the next few months and then start to look at raising interest rates next year. But, uh, but, but you know, uh, the reason why I've been so adamant that we're going to head into an economic crisis is that uh, when you have interest rates so low for so long and you have enormous amounts of debt, well, once you raise the interest rates, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the debt servicing costs will go up. Um, and then, and then something will blow up. Um, uh, so, so, so in the meantime, we have just seen um, uh, that you know, as, as interest rates have been relatively low um, over the last uh, decade or so, we've just seen enormous amounts of borrowing, and, and that historically has never been sustainable. So we've got uh, very high debt around the world and in Australia. That's right. We're actually seeing already uh, in the U.S. markets the impact of rising rates. So you know, bond yields are moving up and. Some corporations are now finding that the debt servicing is more complicated than it was. But in Australia, rates still, as you say, are in this very, very low range. And it seems weird to me that we seem to be out of kilter with many of the other economies. So either our economy is, is way weaker, or we've got a whole lot more debt than anybody else, or there's some other reason why we're still stuck down here at these very low rates. There was an interesting article, I think, in 2015-16, where the former governor of the Reserve Bank said that they were looking at the exchange rate, and they wanted an exchange rate of about 75 cents to the dollar, somewhere in that range. And if you look at the exchange rate over the last couple of years, you've seen the exchange rate basically be around that rate. It's sort of gone up a little bit, gone below 75 cents, but it's been basically around that range. So, you know, we, we officially floated the dollar in 83, but for the last couple of years, we've had a semi-quasi fixed exchange rate. And because they, they, they didn't want to add um, further appreciation to the Amer Australian American exchange rate, They've kept interest rates low, uh, but also the, the inflation figures that have been published by the Reserve, uh, by the ABS, has has not uh, gone anywhere close to the two and a half to three uh, percent. But 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 one of the issues, obviously, with that is is that uh, um, well, I mean, look, I think we've covered it in previous episodes about the CPI is an imperfect measure. It doesn't include all prices in the economy. There have been methodological changes which have artificially suppressed what inflation would have been measured under previous methodologies. Um, and, and, and even, in, for example, in 1999, uh, they took, for example, land out of the CPI. So, so, you know, when you look at those factors, the question still is, well, why do they still have inflation targeting? Why are they using the CPI when the current regime has led to um, massive structural imbalances which are completely unsustainable? And so the question then is, if you're suggesting that their strategy is, is, is not set right. Yeah. Right? Which is what you seem to be saying. And we've got really, really low interest rates. Yes. What are they going to do? Are they going to sort of sit there and just uh, keep interest rates low forever? Or are they going to start lifting interest rates? Because if they start lifting interest rates, then the debt burden, which is already humongous, will get even more difficult for many households and small businesses. So it seems to me that we're caught in this sort of low rate environment with perhaps not a huge amount of opportunities to lift rates without creating a lot of damage to the economy. And yet the rates are too low. Yeah. So, so, so there, was an art, there was two articles. I wrote one last year and I wrote one this year. Um, and, and it's just, just been published on as good as God So we're going to sort of, uh, we're going to obviously put it in the notes of, in terms of YouTube. Mm. But, but, but if you look at the long term, um, in terms of the, the long term average for interest rates from April of 1990 when it was at its peak to now where it's at the lowest level, the average is about 5.1%. Um, and, and basically what I've argued last year and this year is, is that the, gov the, the, the government and the Reserve Bank have no capacity to raise interest rates to the long-term average because if it did, it would crash the economy because the, because the debt is too high. Mm. So the question is, well, what are, the, what are they doing at the moment and what are they going to do in the future? So for a while I've thought, that because you've seen in the in the media and obviously in the last episode we talked about financial propaganda, the banks and the real estate industry have said there is no bubble, and because there is no bubble, um, just allow things to continue as they are. Um, growth is good, jobs is good, um, nothing to worry about. So for a while I thought, well, maybe the RBA and the governor doesn't see a bubble, and, and so they think that interest rates are too low for too long. Um, you know, it's it, it, it is okay, and, and obviously if you don't see a bubble. 
pretty much like they didn't see the, the GFC coming. And if you, obviously, if you look at uh, comments by Glenn Stevens in early 2008, or even Bernanke, I mean, I mean, they basically said everything's fine, they don't see anything, and basically the GFC sort of, you know, came upon them, um, you know, out of the blue. So I thought for a while, maybe he doesn't see it. Uh, but, but then actually I found a research paper that the governor published uh, in 1997 when he was the head of the economic research department at the RBA with uh, one, of his, one of his fellow colleagues, uh, Christopher Kent. And now Christopher Kent is the assistant governor at the RBA for financial markets. And they had, so this, this the, the paper, the title of this paper was Asset Price Bubbles and Monetary Policy. And, and they had quite a few interesting things to say um, in this paper about what should you do with interest rates when you've got a bubble. Um, and, and I was just in Parliament in the past week speaking to a few politicians and I was uh, repeating some of these key paragraphs um, and, and, and I was getting some interesting reactions. So, so there's two paragraphs I want to read to you that really I think set the scene because either they don't see a bubble and we're flying blind into a bubble or they see it and they're doing something else. So, 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 so here's the first paragraph. They said, uh, so this is 97 Low and Kent. They said, uh, now suppose that the central bank can increase the likelihood of a bubble bursting by raising interest rates. In this case, it may make sense for the central bank to do so early on in the life of the bubble, even though this will increase the, lo- the likelihood of inflation being below target in the near term. This is desirable, however, because it, it, it also decreases the chance of the bubble continuing and hence of much more extreme outcomes for inflation and output in the longer term. So you notice in this quote, the governor is saying, when you catch a bubble early, strategically raise interest rates to, um, to ensure the bubble doesn't get out of control. Now, uh, one could argue that the bubble started to form in a big way around 2000. 2000, 2001, 2002, when you saw a massive increase in house prices, massive increase in, in the amount of speculation and borrowing that was happening. Uh, and then obviously around 2002, the market started to stabilize, started to, to cool down. And then obviously it started ramping up again in I think uh, 06, 07, again, GFC cooled down. And now we've had since probably about 2012, a really increase um, um, in terms of borrowing and in terms of house debt. So, so we've seen um, a few stages of this where it's a big spurt, uh, stable, big spurt, stable. So, so obviously, uh, previous to 2016, he was a senior official at the bank, but he wasn't the governor. So the fact that he's been governor for two years, uh, it, can, it can easily be argued that uh, when he became governor, it wasn't early on in the life of the bubble. It was actually quite late. Mm. So, so by his own logic... Um, uh, even though I and Peter, you know Tim Wilson, the member for Goldstein, early in, in the year argued for high interest rates in, in a German speech in Parliament, Peter Costello um, argued in the Australian last year for raising interest rates to send a price signal to the market to say start saving, stop borrowing so much money. Uh, by his own logic, you should only do this at the, uh, you know early on in the life of the bubble. But the problem with that is, is obviously he has allowed the bubble during his tenure to blow up to astronomical proportions because he sat on his hands. Now, uh, so if he's saying that early on do something, well, what does he say when, he, when you're in late in the bubble? So he says actually something very interesting about that. And he says, the intuition is that if it is likely that the bubble will collapse under its own weight, the case for monetary policy to be used in an attempt to burst the bubble is much weaker. If there is a higher probability that the bubble will burst of its own accord, monetary policy needs to be more concerned with the contractory effects of the expected collapse. In some circumstances, this might require a reduction in in interest rates before the collapse actually occurs. So what he's saying here is is that when you see a bubble about to burst, um, don't do anything to pop it, let it pop by itself, and then try uh, try to react to the after effects of the bubble bursting um, when, when it actually bursts. Now, if this is now this was 20 years ago, so so this may be his mentality today. He may he may have a different framework. But if this is his mentality, maybe. So my initial assumption was he can't see it. Well, maybe he has been able to see it, and he's just been sitting on his hands for two years, waiting for it to blow up, waiting for the middle class to be wiped out, and then he's going to do something afterwards. But in that time, he has allowed the bubble to grow and he has done nothing about it. And, and, and so when I was um, 
you know, meeting one, you know, a particular member of parliament during the week. And I, I said this paragraph, I said, you know, to the politician, I said, do you know what this means? I said, the governor who's being paid a million dollars, who's blowing up this massive bubble, he's sitting on his hands waiting for it to potentially blow up. And I said to him, I said to the politician, who's going to be accountable for this, for, for, for this action, which is largely in the, in the, in the belly week of the, of the RBA? I pointed out the politician and said, you politician, you're going to be taking the heat from the Australian people when they, when they, when they sort of have, have, you know, they may lose their house, they, they, they may lose their job, they may be struggling to make these debts. Um, but, 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 the, but you're going to take the hit when the governor has allowed this to blow up, and, he, and, and you know, and he's according to his own words, he potentially may just be waiting for it to blow up. And, and so, so I just find this extraordinary. Now, uh, the, so obviously he says when it blows up, the impact of it blowing up is going to be contractory. So, so it's a debt deflationary depression recession. So he then says, well, um, do something about that when that occurs. Well, the historical. Uh, technique of the Reserve Bank when you get a contraction, a contraction in the economy is to lower interest rates. Mm. Well, we're, we're officially at one and a half. So the question is, well, if he's waiting for it to blow up and he says we're going to mop it up after it blows up, well, where's it going to go? I mean, you had it at the GFC, you had in September of 2008 when um, Lehman Brothers uh, um, uh, defaulted or, became, or declared insolvency, that the cash rate was at seven and a, half, seven and a quarter. And then they took from seven and a quarter over a couple of months down to three percent. So, well, they reduced it by four and a quarter percent at the GFC. Well, if we have another episode now, we're at one and a half. Well, where are they going to go? Well, I, th I think this is this is the concern. They're going to go to zero. Now, if they go to zero, um, zero percent official interest rates. I mean, one, one could argue that that's going to take mortgage rates to about two and a half percent. So I think in a, you know when we were speaking before this uh, filming of this episode, for your survey sample, um, about half the people who were suffering mortgage stress today would be okay because they would be sort of better off about five six hundred dollars a month better off with two and a half percent mortgage rates. Mm. But if that were to occur, well, what's that going to do? That's just going to send a signal out to the market to go borrow more money, um, and we're just kicking the can down the road until an even bigger bubble blows up. And it's just going to be astronomical. So, 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 so here's the real danger. And, and obviously, um, I, I mean, for me, I just think the fact that we've got low interest rates and it's blown up the biggest bubble in Australian history and we can't raise interest rates without crashing the economy uh, and we have a framework in which we're using to make our monetary policy decisions. Um, it, it just says to me that there's chronic policy failure when it comes to how we think about money, how we think about monetary policy, how we think about interest rates. And, and obviously... Um, you know, this particular governor, this particular board is, is actually conducting monetary policy in a way that I think is reckless. That's going to ultimately be, it's going to blow up and it's going to be counterproductive to millions of Australians. So we've thought about this then from an interest rate perspective. Yeah. Now, there are other suggestions out there as to how to tackle the current crisis that we've got, including, for example, Glass-Steagall. So how does that sort of idea fit in with what you're talking about? Sure. So, so I think it's fair to say that there's quite a few people in the market who are very much focused on the banks. Uh, obviously, with the Royal Commission, um, uh, people looking at what, what APRA is doing in terms of prudential regulation, uh, uh, you know, but also whether they have prosecuted people, um, whether they have brought cases forward when there's, been, when there's been clear breaches of the law. Um, and, 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 and so obviously, you know, when people are looking at the amount of risk in the financial system, uh, people are looking at uh, the activities of overseas banks uh, with, with uh, derivatives, with uh, credit default swaps, um, things like um, um, collateralized debt obligations, which are now being rebranded as collateralized loan obligations. It is the same sort of garbage. And obviously people you know, like uh, Robbie Barwick with the CEC are talking about Glass-Steagall, you know, ending virtual um, structural uh, integration, but also horizontal integration. And, and, I, and I think these are very important aspects that need to be considered um, uh, in terms of future policy and what this could mean 
um, you know, in terms of as we go forward to the coming crisis. But but I, you know, I've I've been on the CC show. I've, you know, I speak to Robbie on a consistent basis. But for me, um, that is secondary to what I think the main game is, and the main game is is interest rates. It is monetary policy. It is the amount. It is the price signal in which people are being allowed to borrow. Um, and until you re- fix this central issue, um, even if you reform the banks, even if you do Glass Steagall. Um, you're still going to get people borrowing way too much money in the economy. So, um, so yes, so, so I, I think it's it, it's a it's an important issue, uh, but it, it's not going to solve the big structural dilemmas in the economy. And, and, and ultimately, you have to look at interest rates. You have to look at the monetary policy framework. You have to think about well, um, the, the 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 RBA board has certain resp- has certain functions. I think those functions need to be reviewed. Potentially, the senior leadership of the bank needs to be re-examined, and maybe have some fr- some fresh people in there. Uh, but also, um, the 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 framework, the, the, this inflation targeting two to three percent. You know, we we should be looking at the CPI, whether that's a genuine measure of inflation, uh, whether the current interest rate targeting regime is still appropriate, or or whether we need to be looking at a, at a new framework of how do we think about. The role of interest rates, the role of money versus economic growth, unemployment, uh, and obviously other key metrics in the in the economy, and come up with a new way to think about these things so that we can have economic growth, we can have economic progress, but we don't have these big structural imbalances and these big bubbles um, that, that 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 ultimately end up in disaster. So so you know, I mean, one of the one of the jokes that Robbie and I have is is that you know you think about the uh, you think about the Godfather, well he, you know the CC and, and Robbie are going after the banks, uh, and and you know I, I like to say that you know, Robbie uh, you're going after uh, uh, Tessio and Clemenza the foot soldiers, but 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 but, but, but who is the Don uh, who's the Don Colleone in this episode? Well it, it, it's it's the RBA. I mean I mean the RBA and Philip Lowe they're the real power structure behind what the banks are doing. Because even though the banks have been found to have been in breach of the law, in some cases illegality, the amount of uh, borrowing or lending the banks have been able to do has been about the amount of money pumped into the system by the Reserve Bank. It's been about the price of credit. And, and, and if we had a more responsible monetary policy, I think the scale of the problems in the banking system, even under the current regulatory regime, would have been less relative to uh, what, what we have seen you know, uh, over the last decade, but also what's been exposed uh, in terms of uh, what the uh, Bank Royal Commission has shown. So, 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 so while we have this current governor, this current framework, these current interest rate levels, um, I don't see much change coming forward. I mean, if we reform banking, if there is Glass-Steagall, which I suspect won't happen because the ma- major parties won't allow Glass-Steagall to go forward in Parliament. But but even if the, if it were to happen, we're still going to have a, 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 a great crash because uh, the monetary policy in this country um, has failed us. Observation there also is if they do take rates lower because effectively, you know, the bubble erupts and bursts. At the same time as overseas, rates are going the other way. That's going to really murder the exchange rate, isn't it? Uh, what well, well, so, 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 so the key question here is, is that when, when I say they may lower once the bubble bursts um, and, and you have contractual effects, well, that contractual effects is unlikely to be just in Australia alone. Right. So, so what I suspect is happening is you're seeing a number of uh, central banks around the world, and this is what Jim Rickards has said about the Americans. The Americans are raising rates now, preparing for the next recession. When the recession hits, they're going to take them back to zero again. So, 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 so what I think it would be would happen is, is that if the reserve bank went to zero, it would be at the same time that the other central banks are lowering interest rates. So, but, but obviously, you know, I mean, the Americans are now at 2%, we're at one and a half percent, so the Americans would have greater capacity to lower interest rates. Uh, but obviously, we look at Japan now, they're at negative, mm-hmm. you know, some of the European countries, they have been negative. And, you know, there is, there is a da- in my view, dangerous literature among you know institutions and academics about negative interest rates, and this has been tested out in certain markets. So um, I don't think quantitative easing has been ruled out in Australia. I don't think negative interest rates has been ruled out in Australia, and and just in the ordinary conversation, I mean, I say I I, I say to people, 
well, we may have negative interest rates. And they go, well, what does that mean? I said, well, rather than the bank paying you for your money to be in the bank, well, you've got to pay the bank for, for, the, for, the, priv- for, for, the, for the privilege of putting your money in that institution. And the question is, well, how does it make commercial sense? And it doesn't make commercial no. sense. So when this happened in Japan, I mean, the, the, number, one consumer, the, the number one consumer item was safes. Mm. People went and got safes, put them in the house and saying, well, why am I going to pay a certain percentage to the bank just to have cash sitting in the account? I might as well just have, take the physical cash and put it in my own house and I don't pay the fee. So, so all of this is just reckless policy. Uh, it's, just blown up, like it's just blown up massive debt and, and, and asset price bubbles. And it's completely unsustainable. Now, I think the key question at this point is to say, well, what is the bubble? Because one could argue that with, with the Royal Commission, and then when you look at uh, in terms of APRA, uh, what, what APRA is doing with some of these macro potential controls, um, you're seeing slower credit growth in the June quarter relative to the March quarter. And I think this is something you've talked about on a previous post as well. And, and so as a, as, a, as a result of that, you're seeing in particular markets, uh, I mean, obviously Perth was the mining boom, but you're seeing in Sydney and Melbourne in particular, you're seeing a, a, a decrease in in property prices. And what, what what would be fair to say for Sydney about or eight percent? Five to six percent on average, higher in some places. Some postcodes now are to twenty two percent down on a year ago. Okay, so so five to so across the Sydney basin, about five to six yep. percent. So so yeah, so some people may look at that and say, well, uh, and I've had politicians say this to me who who come from electorates in Sydney, and they're, and they're looking at house prices and saying, well, by by independent of the monetary policy, by looking at the the APRA policy and, and, and sentiment in general, we are seeing a deflate a slow d- a deflating of the bubble, and therefore, the concerns I have. Um, are not that significant because the policies put in place by the Turnbull government are actually working to start to deflate the issue. Now, for me, house prices or real estate prices is not the bubble. Um, the bubble for me is the amount of debt. Yep. Um, and, and the amount of debt that we're seeing is still growing. And obviously, June gr- grew slower than March, but it is still growing. So, I, so when politicians say this to me, I say, well, hang on. The, the the bubble is not the prices. The bubble is the debt, and the and there is no evidence to suggest that that the debt is actually shrinking, and therefore um, the problem is actually getting worse as we go forward. It's not actually getting better. Yep. And in fact, the household data on debt, household debt data, continues to rise. Right. So on average, it's sort of seven percent growth at the moment, yep. according to the RBA statistics for for um, housing debt. Seven percent. And that's at a time when home prices are actually sliding. Exactly. So, in fact, you can see exactly what you're saying. You can see that the real question is not house prices. The real question is debt and where debt is going. And debt is still rising. It is. It is. In the situation where incomes are not rising in real terms. Yep. Where household savings are continuing to be eroded where more people are actually now putting more on credit cards and grabbing other types of personal credit as well as housing credit. So we're digging ourselves in ever deeper hole because the interest rate setting is wrong. Absolutely. So, so, so yeah, so I mean, one of the, one of the things that really caught my attention um, after the GFC was, so, you know, I went and did a bachelor's degree of economics from the University of New South Wales. I did my honours at the University of Wollongong. Um, and, and you get taught certain frameworks, um, Keynesian, neoclassical, um, you know, rational expectations, efficient market hypothesis, um, all of this sort of nonsense. And, 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 and for me, um, a lot of people who subscribe to these frameworks and these models and these theories didn't see the GFC coming. Yeah. That we weren't prepared. The media says no one saw it coming. Um, uh, and everyone caught by surprise. Well, there's a reason why that happened is, 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 you know, the frameworks that you're taught at, at, at universities in this country don't actually give you a real perspective of how an economy works. So, so a number of these theories, um, in my view, are actually flawed. And it took me about 10 years to get some of these ideas out of my head and actually figure out what, what actually happened. Mm-hmm. But after the GFC, I started, started saying to myself, well, there were certain people, particularly in America, who... Year, you know, two, three years before the GFC said the GFC is coming. Um, and I said, well, what framework did they adopt 
that allow them to see this? Because you know, when you look at different economic theories, well, I think uh, you know what what is the strength of the theory is its ability to analyze a current situation, but also to forecast going forward. So there was a theory uh, or a framework that was actually quite instructive of of how the GFC would play out. And that's uh, that's what they call the Austrian school. So this is Ludwig von Mises. He wrote a book in 1912 called The Theory of Money Credit. And I've read certain elements of the book. And, and, and in that book about monetary policy, he, he basically says that interest rates is a price mm. and, and it sends a signal to the market. And when it's, when it, when it obviously when, when the signal is too high uh, or when, when, when interest rates are too high, it sends a signal for it's a good time to save. When the signal is low, or artificially low by governments and central banks printing excessive amounts of money. And, and this is obviously where in the first episode that we did where we looked at the rate of growth of broad money versus the CPI, well, when the, gov- when the central bank prints money and pushes it through the banking system, so broad money is not just the currency, um, the, the physical currency that we did in episode three, but it's also um, the amount of money in the, in the uh, in the banking system as well. And obviously, once the uh, central bank prints the money, pushes it into the banking system, and then the banks lend to to people like you and me and businesses, etc., that money comes in the form of debt. So all of that sort of money is captured in broad money, and that's been growing at seven and a half percent since the last recession. So, um, so so basically that amount of credit growth is a function of the price of credit. And obviously we've seen from the last 28 years, it's, been, it's gone from 15% to, to 1.5%. So, so it's, it's a clear signal that there's a price signal being put in the market. And obviously the, the, the Austrian school basically says that um, when you artificially uh, uh, have artificially lower interest rates to unsustainable levels, you know, you have your boom, everyone's borrowing, everyone's speculating, property, stocks, bonds, whatever the case may be. Uh, and then it will come to a point where people can't sustain those debts, people become insolvent, and then it crashes. So, so, so those people who, who looked at that basic framework that was outlined in 1912 basically could see what was happening in the north and saying, this is, this is not what's go- this is going to lead to a bad outcome. And they will write. So this is, you know, you're on pause, you're Peter Schiff, people like that. And then what did the central banks do in this country and elsewhere? That they lowered interest rates. And obviously around the world, we didn't go to zero. Uh, I mean, we stayed at 3% and we've gone down to 1.5% over the last decade. But a number of countries around the world have went to zero. Now, who, who said zero was a good idea? <laughs> it was actually John Maynard Keynes. I mean, John Maynard Keynes in several publications said you should take the interest rate to zero. Uh, and, and that's what for the, we've done for the last decade. Um, and what's, what's, what's that happened? Well, it, it's blown up the biggest bubble in the history of the world and the biggest bubble in this country. Now, when, when, when Keynes was saying this nonsense back in the 20s, 30s and 40s, people said, well, you know, we, we sort of know what the outcomes of this will be um, and it's not going to be good for society. And he said, well, in the long term, uh, we're all dead. So basically, you know, you continue after a while and then well, we won't have to bear the responsibility of, of what we've done um, because we're going to be dead. Well, um, over the last 30 years, I mean, people who just say in the 60s, um, you know, who were at the head of the RBA, you know, 30 years ago, well, may, those people may be dead 30 years on, whereas you and me have to bear the consequences of this. Um, and and it's, a, it's a complete failure. So we followed the Keynesian path uh, pre-GFC, but particularly post-GFC with the zero interest rates. Uh, we've got with a governor, at, you know, at the moment that has basically cornered himself at this 1.5% mark. And he's basically saying because infl- the official CPI won't get to 25 until 2021, we've got to keep interest rates stable at the moment. Um, and, and, and all of this is doing is just generating more debt, um, more structural imbalances in the economy. Um, and, and again, you know, in the history of humanity, you have never seen a bubble this big that has ended up um, in, in, a, in a nice situation. This is not going to be orderly. Um, uh, and, 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 and obviously, you know, you look at what's happened uh, in the last couple of weeks. Turkey, the Turkish currency, uh, t- two Fridays ago, collapsed 14%. Uh, there's all the b- big speculation about risk of cont- contagion. Well, who's the banking system that's most exposed to the Turks? It's the Spanish. Um, and if the Spanish go, the Italians go, the French go, and, and, and who, who's, which bank in Europe is the most exposed to the Italians and the Spanish? Deutsche Bank. 
it goes back to Frankfurt. And if Deutsche Bank, I mean, and Deutsche, and some people say Deutsche Bank's like five times the size of Lehman Brothers, particularly with the derivatives book. If Deutsche Bank goes, the market's melt down in 24 hours. So, 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 so here we are, you know, on the verge of an Armageddon um, that's going to have effects that this, this generation, my generation, but my mum's generation has never seen before um, because you really have to go back to the 30s to get any sense of what, what we're really talking about. And you've got a governor who's on a million dollars a year by his own words. He, he, may, he may be completely blind. He may not see a bubble. Or he may see it and he's just waiting for it to collapse. And yet he won't tell the public. He won't tell the politicians. And we're all just uh, borrowing flying blind until this thing ultimately breaks. John, I'm depressed. Thank you very much for that. Very interesting. And I think um, our next conversation should be beyond the bubble. In other words, what do, we, what do we need to do to look beyond it, right? Because clearly, if the issue is as big as you suggest it is, and we can't look to the Reserve Bank for a way out, then we've got to find alternative routes. Sure. Thank you, John. So... Thank you very much for watching this episode. If you found this interesting, please do uh, like the post and also consider supporting our work via our Patreon page. There's a link to that. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you again next time. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. See you next time.